hello everyone hope you're all doing well and enjoying some of the sunshine at the moment um okay so let's carry on with the kriegers we are on to chapter 29 lucy's big idea so we just left lucy having stopped mayor noing from destroying the woleb and she said she had an idea but we're not sure what it is yet <coughs> okay only one more house lucy said to her dad as she wound down the window of his stinky rubbish truck. They pulled up outside Ella's house. Good evening, Mayor Noy, Mr Dunkson said, jumping out of the truck with a chirpy tip of his cap, flat cap. The mayor came out of his front door, struggling with three heavy bags of rubbish, while Mrs Noy and Ella watched from the doorway, giggling quietly. Good evening, Mr Dunkston. Good evening, Lucy, he said. Lovely pyjamas. Lucy said, trying not to burst out laughing at the mayor's neatly ironed pink silk pyjamas. Mm, thank you, Ella got them for me, <clears throat> he mumbled. Uh, are we all set for tonight? Yes, I think everything's ready, Lucy replied from the passenger seat of the smelly truck. Good, we shall see you at sunset then, young Lucy. Fingers crossed your plan works, the mayor said. Mr Dunkston threw the mayor's rubbish bags into the back of the truck and jumped into the driver's seat. See you there, Lucy called out to Ella and waved. They whizzed around Whiffington as the evening sun dropped low in the sky. Lucy, Mr Dunkston said, no matter what happens tonight, I'm proud of you. Thanks, Dad, Lucy said. I just hope it works. Me too, Lucy Pops. Me too. They stopped off at their home, which was halfway through being repaired from the damage caused by the whopping great drill. Mrs Dunstan stepped out of the front door, edged her way around the scaffolding and hopped into the truck with them. She was wearing her dressing gown and PJs and looked ready for bed. Oh, it feels good to have you home, she said, throwing her arms around Mr Dunstan's neck and giving him a big kiss. Not as good as it feels to be home, he replied with a huge grin on his face. Ready for the big night, Lucy Pops? Mrs Dunstan asked. I am. I just hope they are, Lucy said with a hint of nervousness in her voice. They drove through the streets to a place Mr Dunkston knew like the back of his grubby hand. The sign swinging outside the entrance wed, wed, read Whiffington Dump. But tonight it looked rather different. It was no longer Whiffington Dump, it was Camp Whiffington. As they pulled in through the gates they were greeted by two familiar faces. Hi, Mr Kirk. Hi, Norman, Lucy said as she jumped down from the truck. Is everything going to plan? Indeed it is, Lucy. The campsite is up and running, replied Mr Quirk. No torches, right? Norman lifted up a huge bag full of confiscated torches and Lucy smiled. Everything's under control, Lucy. Scout's honour, said Norman with a salute. That reminds me, um, this is for you. He pulled out a green and yellow scarf and a little woggle out of his pocket. He placed the scarf around Lucy's neck, fastened it with the woggle and straightened it up. Welcome to Whiffington Scout Troop, he told her, smiling. Aha, do we have a new member? Norman's dad called, popping his scout leader hat on, and on his head excitedly. Lucy looked into Norman's hopeful eye, then around the wonderful work he and his father had put into Camp Whiffington. Actually, it's Two new members, Lucy said, noticing that Ella had just arrived. Hey, Ella. Hi, Lucy. Good evening, Norman, Ella said politely, being a cute little angel now that her mama and papa were back. Ella, I've just signed you up for the Whiffington Scout Troop with me. You did what? Ella whispered in horror. That's right, you're a scout now. I'm certainly not. You are if you don't want your mama to find out that you went skipping through Whiffington in her wedding dress. Lucy whispered. Well, that's fantastic news, Mr Quirk cried. New recruits are most welcome. We don't get many, do we, Norman? In such unusual circumstances, I'm delighted to present to you both with your first scout badges. And with that, he whipped out two circular woven patches and handed one to Lucy and one to Ella. The starting a new adventure badge, he said. Lucy slicked her hair to one side, looked at the small patch in her hand and felt her cheeks turn a little red. 
She couldn't stop the corners of her mouth turning up with pride. She glanced over at Ella, who was wearing the exact same expression, but quickly put her sunglasses on to hide it. They both suddenly knew why Norman took his badges so seriously. Norman proudly pointed the same badge sewn onto his jumper and gave them both a thumbs up. And may I ask how you both came to hear about the Whiffington Scout Troop? Mr. asked Mr Quirk. Ella pointed her finger at Norman accusingly. Lucy nodded in agreement. Then if I'm not mistaken, there is one more badge to be awarded tonight, Mr Quirk said, for getting one or more people to join our troop for bringing people together. Norman. Norman got down on one knee and looked like he was about to be knighted by the Queen for being handed a scout badge by his dad. There he is, down on his knee. Getting very excited about his scout badge there. Any of you in the Cubs? Do you get badges? I award you the friendship badge, said Mr. Quirk, handing over the little patch. Lucy and Ella applauded Norman as he stared out, stared at the badge. He let out a big sigh. <sighs> What's wrong? Lucy asked. Well, he's just wanted this badge for so long. Norm muttered, rubbing his thumb over it. And now you have it, Norm, Ella said, nudging him. Yeah, I know, but I've just realised it wasn't the badge I wanted, Norman said, his cheeks flushing red. And it was the friends that came with it. Lucy put his, her arm around his shoulders and gave him a squeeze. I think I'm going to be sick, Ella mumbled. Lucy Pops, nearly time, Mr Dunstan called. There was a huge crowd starting to gather in Camp Whiffington. Families were pitching tents and laying blankets on the ground. The smell of hot chocolate boiling over campfires hung in the air as the grown-ups shared stories of their time in the Wolo, while the children kept their own adventures secret. Nearly sunset, Lucy heard them whisper. I wonder if they'll show up, said another. The crowd parted, allowing the Dunstan's pongy vehicle to pull up, with Lucy, Norman and Ella walking beside it. Mr Dunstan jumped out to join Lucy. Her heart pounded in her chest. Something wonderful came into view in front of her. On the spot where there was once a great big pile of stinking rotten waste, now sat something marvellous, something genius, something only a child could think of. A whopping great bed. It had four thick tree trunks as posts, and as they got closer, a swarm of Whiffington Air Force helicopters lowered a, momental, a monumental mattress the size of a football field and a humongous pillow stuffed with hundreds of normal-sized pillows down into place on top of the bed. It was the most incredible thing Lucy had ever seen. they're putting a bed there. Seems a bit strange, doesn't it? Although it was a bed fit for a giant to sleep in, no one would be lying on it. It wasn't made for sleeping in. It was the deep, dark, shadowy patch underneath the giant bed that really mattered. As Mr Dunstan and Lucy walked up to the enormous bed, the crowd cheered and whooped. There she is, that's Lucy. Lucy nervously unloaded the last few sacks of rubbish and tossed them onto the pile of stinking bin bags, old furniture and other bits and bobs at the bottom of the bed. She took a step back and admired the mountain of Whiffington's filthy, rotten garbage, the town's peace offering to the Creekers. There's just the edge of it. Look at all the different things on there. What can you see? It's a table, a bike wheel. Is that a television down there? computer. Then Lucy and her mum and dad found a spot in the crowd, a little distance away from the enormous bed. Mr Dunstan rolled out three sleeping bags, then reached into his pocket and pulled something out. Fancy trying to beat your record? Lucy Pops, he said, waving a bag of jelly babies in the air with a smile. Impossible, her mum chuckled. Lucy and Mr Dunstan gave each other a look and both said it at exactly the same time. Impossible isn't real. 
and the three of them burst out laughing. The sun slowly set over Whittington. Everybody stared longingly into the darkness beneath the enormous bed, looking, hoping for a sign of movement. As the night drew on, with not the slightest creak, flasks of hot chocolate ran dry, and the sound of tired yawns grew more frequent, as the campfires calmed to glowing embers. I don't think they're coming, Lucy heard someone whisper. It hasn't worked. Should we all go home? What do we do now? We wait, Lucy said. Give them time. But time ticked on. And there was not even the slightest sign of a creeper. Lucy stared as hard as she could into the blackness beneath the oversized bed, willing herself to see some sort of movement. But all she saw was piles and piles of dirty rubbish sitting there, stinking out the night. Was this all just a silly, childish idea? Building a giant bed, collecting the town's rubbish in the evening and leaving it out for the creakers to take? Please, Grant. Lucy thought, please guff, Lucy hoped, please scratch and sniff, Lucy wished. She didn't dare take her eyes off of the shadows, she just stared at the blackness, the darkness, the nothing. Mm. Is her plan going to work or is it all just a very silly idea? Who knows, we will find out tomorrow. For chapter 30, Wakey Wakey Whiffington. Okay, we're almost there. I've got one more chapter to go, so I'll see you tomorrow for that last chapter, and I hope you've really enjoyed the book. Bye!